Now, before we go into the question uh, and answer uh, session, there was a suggestion by my colleague Khalid Shukri, and I think it's extremely valuable. And Khalid suggested, let's do a quick round of the table because we have like an amazing assemblage of national anchor points and expertise here from across Europe. So if I could invite you to start and then we just zigzag mm -hmm. uh, through the room and uh, maybe share, we share the microphone because, and if you yep. could pass it on because we would like to record that as well. We start here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rikard Domey from the Language Council in Sweden. Simonetta Montemagni from uh, the Institute of Computational Linguistics in Pisa. Sabine Kirschmeier-Andersen, uh, the Danish Language Council. Mike Rosner from the University of Malta. Uh, Hélène Majot from uh, Elda working on the project. Thank you. I'm Mikkel Hanstein. I'm from Norway, from uh, uh, Agency for ICT and Public Administration in Norway. Sarah Jane Yelsten, also from the Agency of Public Management and IT in Norway. I'm Maciej Gognichuk. I'm from uh, Polish Academy of Sciences, Warsaw, Poland. No. I'm Maria Czernikowa from Prague, from Ministry of Education. Martin Lutz, Estonia. Gerhard Bodin, University of Vienna. David Perez from, from, uh, from Spain, uh, from the uh, uh, Ministry of, of Industry, Energy and Tourism. Veroni Koster, Ghent University in Belgium. Kadri Vare, Estonia, <coughs> representing uh, Estonian. Uh, uh, the Center of Estonian la Language Resources. Hi, my name is Kristina Dobrova. I'm from uh, Ministry of Transport, Information Technologies and Communications in Bulgaria. My name is Marko Tadic. I'm coming from University of Zagreb, Croatia. I'm Dan Tufish, coming from Romania, Institute for Artificial Intelligence of the Romanian Academy. Tomasz Vadadi, Hungarian Academy of Sciences, Budapest. Renata Spukiene, Tilde, Information Technologies, Lithuania. I'm Carol Tiberius from the Institute of Dutch Lexicology in the Netherlands. I'm Diana Schnirzova from Ministry of Culture of the Slovak Republic. I'm Miros Umrik from the Institute of Linguistics, Slovak Academy of Sciences. Alain Repour, head of the Translation Center in Paris, Economy uh, and Finance Ministry. François Yvon, French CNRS. My name is Svetla Koeva from the Institute for Bulgarian Language. I'm Theresa Lane from the ADAPT Center at Dublin City University in Ireland. Jean Rodrigues from University of Lisbon, Portugal. Imre Bortis uh, from the University of Helsinki, Finland. Uh, what I wanted to say about the first LRB meeting, um, well, in a way, this is the first LRB meeting. How it happened is the meeting in Riga in April, and I was asked um, this morning already um, by um, Mr. Rupo, um, the meeting in Riga in April, it was officially our first meeting. But then ELRC didn't know yet that our LRB, our Language Resources Board, would be extended. Because we started first um, with representatives um, only um, from each country, but which would cover only the technological side. So there were um, technology specialists um, for um, languages in each country represented in the board. And a suggestion was made to <coughs> not just represent the country from the technology side, but also because this is our target um, from the public sector. So what happened um, since summer that um, step by step and bit by bit, um, also together with the organization of the workshop, um, we found public sector um, representatives um, who um, would represent each country in, um, well, on the um, national administration um, level. Um, so our board was actually intended um, or extended and um, so far we have nominated um, a handful um, of seven or eight um, public sector representatives um, for ELRC, and there are more to come. 
So I would assume that the next meeting, um, which would happen <laughs> roughly in half a year's time, um, would um, well be too big already for this room and <laughs> maybe even for a larger room. So thank you uh, for all the ones who have joined us um, newly from the public administration side and thank you to all technology national anchor points who have been with us already from the beginning of the project. Uh, okay, there are some written material that has to be translated to, to Sweden for me. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there money for involving the, the local European Union translators in Sweden to, to do that? Or is, th is it me that, are <laughs> that is going to do that? <laughs> of course. Um. To be honest, yes, it would be you. No, of course not. I mean, this is too much. Um, how we proceeded in most countries, um, it is actually we um, we looked for uh, speakers for each session of the workshop, and then because it's so individual, um, they adapted the slides themselves. So they had the um, English master slides, but in fact there was so much adaptation. I just want to say one thing: it was um, the presentation in Germany by uh, by Alexander Weibel on uh, languages and language technologies in Germany. It was really, um, th there were a few bits, so, so the, the theme um, of the presentation, it was clear and it was there, but he added so uh, many really nice materials, demonstrations, um, and this can only be done in a local language. So um, it would be the presenters themselves um, typically um, to adapt the presentations and then of course to translate them. But, but I mean the invitation and press release and material like that. I think also that material needs to be adapted to the specifics of the country, the locale, uh, your knowledge uh, of the people that you try to address, that you try to engage and, and, and capture. Um, so um, the material that we provide are, the main idea is to, to give some harmonization across Europe in terms of the global messaging. Uh, the local adaptation, the how you embrace this and how you fill this with life, um, it, it actually gives quite a bit of variation uh, in, in how you materialize that. Um, and I think that runs across the material. So for example, the what uh, Andrea just mentioned with the presentation on the German language technologies, um, Alex Weibel had a live speech to text translation system. So he was giving his presentation and on the screens in the room, so he was giving it in English and then later in German, there was live automatic translation of what he was saying into, uh, into uh, another language. So when he was speaking in English, it was going into French, when he was speaking uh, in, uh, and then later on I think it was going into German. I think he was speaking English all the time, uh, I, I seem to remember. So, you know, that's, that's a very strong adaptation and he also adapted the contents uh, of the presentation to the specifics of Germany. So we tried to do that already to, to some extent, but there, there is this, uh, there's a, a quite a bit of freedom. Um, it's more than just giving it to translators. Uh, so we also, like for Germany, we in-house, we, we, we made German translations of all the uh, material, uh, but we did this ourselves, you know, and with the, with the other national anchor points, I think the national anchor points, you're often heads of institutions of language data, computational linguistics, natural language processing, um, et cetera. If you have the expertise, the technical terms, and probably the best local language to put that in, and, and of course the knowledge of the field, of the, uh, of the, la uh, of the, the country, and, and, and so on. Um, other than that, how you spend your budget um, is, is up to you. There's 5,000. If you can fit in professional translation for the materials, yes, you can. Um, I think we found that the uh, providing the simultaneous interpretation on the day is one of the biggest costs. I think the other big costs is probably lunch uh, or the, the food, the catering. Um, and um, if you can, um, it helps a lot if the premises, the location where you run this uh, comes for free. And the, um, the, the colleagues from the, the national offices of the DGT, the Director General Translation, often know people in the ministries that have really beautiful buildings, meeting rooms, etc. Ideally, these rooms should be very, very nice. They should be attractive. 
maybe some history attached uh, with it, maybe in a, in a local ministry. They often also have the premises, they have the translator booths already, they have the microphones, they have the earpieces um, and, uh, and all of that. And often, if, if you can enthuse them ab about the, the action, about the activity, about contributing to your local language, then often they are in a position to provide these premises for free. Sometimes the colleagues from, from the DGT, the, the EC representation in the country, they also have wonderful premises. Um, in Berlin, we couldn't use them because they were, I think they're undergoing renovation at the moment. That was the only reason. Otherwise, we would have gone uh, and they would have provided this for free. Uh, absolutely spectacular uh, uh, location. And in the end, we went to a uh, ministry in uh, a former, was the former Bundeshaus in, in Berlin. It was also an absolute uh, spectacular location. There are a few things, kind of like, if it's, if it's a highly official ministry, you might end up behind a firewall, you know, and maybe even behind a couple of firewalls. And if you want to do live video streaming, which I think could, can be a really good idea, you have to arrange with the local conditions to poke a hole in the many firewalls and, and get the streaming out. Uh, and maybe even email for the participants, if, if, that's, uh, if that's desired. In, uh, in Athens, for instance, um, the workshops were hosted in the, um, on the premises of the National Hellenic um, um, Association uh, in Riga in the EU representation. Uh, but just to come back to your question, um, so the, um, the materials, uh, slide materials, um, the translation would be done by the speakers. Um, and as you said about the press release, um, in Germany for me, uh, since I'm really in ELRC language, I actually I had a hard time translating it into German. So what we ended up doing is we gave it uh, also to a student just to, to make a translation to someone completely outside this topic area. And then we came back uh, together with our um, PR officer uh, just to publish the press release. Um, um, what also happened, and uh, maybe I would refer to our colleague Dan Tufis. So this is not uh, the publication of the press release, but um, what he did actually, he gave an interview um, and he already raised um, this kind of issue on multilingualism um, with respect to the digital, digital single market. So if you do have um, already any chance um, to promote ELRC um, as part of your normal day-to-day um, -day activities, um, then you can use that opportunity. So you don't need to do anything extra, but just maybe integrate it into your, into your uh, daily, um, daily uh, life. Um, a simple question, I think, um, concerning the contract. Um, who is empowered to sign the contract? Does it have to be an institution or can it be an individual? Um, that would be the institution um, um, with which you are affiliated. Um, so uh, on behalf of the FKE, it will be our managing director, but uh, for the national anchor points, it would be the institution um, you are affiliated with. Um, Well, I appreciate that we are all concerned about the practical matters of, of the workshop organization, but allow me to raise a more general question. Um, and the question is this. In old-fashioned terms, uh, ELRC, uh, to me, is like a support and coordination action. And the question is, what, what is the bigger picture, more concretely, how to explain to the audience, which I'm going to be facing on Monday, by the way, what is going to happen to the data we are eliciting from them? I see very little in the material about it, and even uh, I was uh, surprised to find that there is some, at some point there is mention of uh, some sort of a repository where this uh, data is, <coughs> is going to be uh, submitted to, etc. So in, in very practical terms, what, uh, where, where to send the data, what is going to happen to them, who is going to handle it, and given that on one of these slides, as we'll come to them, there is very emphatically uh, stated that um, automated translation, this new term, is, does not equal 
empty at EC. So uh, I already coached the uh, panel moderators to, and we also had a previous meeting uh, with some of the participants, active participants, and we, we built up a larger picture than just feeding data to MT at EC, which for Hungarian is clearly beyond, beyond acceptable levels. So EC, MT at EC for Hungarian simply doesn't work. Feeding more data doesn't work for the, for the domain it was trained to be, right? So feeding other, uh, other domain data is not necessarily going to contribute to the uh, higher level for Hungarian. So this is our special position, but we are not alone. There are some languages, this is a recognized problem. So we cannot, we cannot simply promote, you know, Hungarian empty at EC and, and, and uh, put the main focus of the workshop as improving what is abysmally uh, non-performing. So that is why we are taking a wider picture and, and uh, we are talking about, uh, I mean, the, the original objective is, uh, is completely sound, right? So we need more data, but we also are hoping that this automated, the concept of automated translation is more wider. So it involves more than just MT, but, but, and this is where I'm coming back to, we don't have the picture of who is going to deal with that. And, and it's not just data, it's processing. And who is going to do that? And are we, if, suppose our workshop proves excellent, there will be plenty of data. So what? Who is going to, who's going to work th with them? We are financing this activity, this ELRC uh, project, so it's our uh, supporting action and uh, we, have, we are responsible for it and we are um, <coughs> guiding and steering it and we are also uh, planning and funding and guiding and steering the next actions, the follow-up actions. So, First, I would like to say that this ELRC is a sort of um, networking uh, action to get things started. <laughs> it has <coughs> relatively limited, modest resources, so it cannot uh, do everything. So that's why I, you know, kind of, I listen with, with understanding about the comments that uh, uh, adapt the slides or do the translations use yourself if you can, if you have unsurmountable problems doing that, that you think that you cannot organize your workshop uh, because you don't know who is going to translate slides, let me know, let Josef know, we will find a solution. So uh, it's not black and white, but the ELRC is a small contract that has to cover 30 countries, it has limited resources. Um, that's one thing. And what was said in the beginning, each, each national workshop is different. And, and yes, Thomas, uh, the Hungarian, the Finnish and the Estonian workshop will be dramatically different from, from the others. Uh, so maybe I start with this, uh, uh, this um, comment of yours that uh, automated translation is not empty at EC because empty at EC for Hungarian does not work and maybe will never work. Uh, but you correctly said that uh, it doesn't mean that, that uh, language resources or corpora are not needed for Hungarian, they are. But it means that another technological solution may be needed for hung Hungarian language. Um, it is not the job of the ELRC to put that in place. We have follow-up uh, actions procurement actions that are going to do that. So patience. But the thing with ELRC is to get started to create the contacts. 
So then you ask, what shall we do with the resources? So if you uh, <coughs> manage to collect large amounts of, of corpora, gigabytes of data, what happens with it and where shall you put them? Um, so I would say we probably will work out a different solution for Hungary, but for most countries that are going to pilot first the improvement of the MTAT-EC system so that your data will go to the MTAT-EC system to improve it, uh, and we will make an experiment with this improvement. You, the data will actually go to DGT, so DG translation of the European uh, Commission. Uh, my colleague uh, Spiridon Pilos, who is not here, he is uh, responsible for that operation. He has, until now, he, uh, taken language resources that um, these member states <coughs> have provided. Uh, later on, when these volumes become significant, we will set up a cloud-based uh, repository, as, as you mentioned. There will be a language resource repository. It's not yet in place. Uh, but we are currently preparing the contracts for uh, the cloud-based resources to, to host, securely host and keep resources. Now, again, what happens to the language resources if you manage to uh, collect some? Uh, if you manage to collect some just like that, it's probably because the language resources are unproblematic in the sense that there is no ownership or uh, intellectual property or copyright issue or that there is no uh, personal data issue, so no need to anonymize, for example, then that's a simple case. Then it's mo most likely uh, open domain data. Uh, and, and that's kind of unproblematic. We can share that without further, uh, in, in many cases, without further contractual arrangements. But for all other types of data, I don't think you will so easily uh, come from the workshop with the, that data in your pocket because it will require discussions about the ownership of the data and the use that will be made of the data and to conclude a license agreement if necessary. This is where the ELRC project can help and they actually have a, a function which is a sort of legal assistance to IPR, intellectual property issues. Um, uh, each case is different of course but there is some room for assistance from the ELRC if you are confronted with a difficult situation uh, on uh, the data provider says I would like to share this data but I don't think I'm allowed to. And this is what Josef also uh, referred to, that maybe the people that are in the workshop, they have resources, they have data, but they are not the ones that are allowed to take the decision to give it to, give it uh, to third parties, give it outside, give it to the European Commission, for example. And that's when we have to engage into discussions, into, uh, um, negotiations um, and uh, um, so um, we usually that means that we usually start with the easy data the easiest data is open data uh, even that finding locating all the useful and valuable open data is already a non-trivial uh, problem where we need the help of you and, and we need the help of the people that you will meet at the uh, country workshops. Um, so we, we will typically start with that because we can get started and, and uh, collect something without uh, you know, uh, running into too much frustration. Uh, but we will later on in the later stages, of course, we'll have to run the negotiations and, and the, the next uh, steps as well. So, um, if maybe since it was not, it didn't come forward yet. Uh, what is the what is the the role? I mean, uh, some of the questions that that you raised. Uh, I mean, what is the message? What is the context? They will come up in the in the later uh, when we run through the contents. Uh, 
so I hope they will be answered there. I just say one thing uh, right now up front. Um, what is the role of the ELRC project? So what is the commission doing? What is the ELRC doing and how? So we uh, uh, fund the, the CEF program. I will have slides on that. Uh, because we don't have enough internal resources to, to do all this kind of coordination work and uh, prepare presentations and master slides and, and run different things. So that's the basic reason why the Commission outsourced or contracted this work to the ELRC consortium. That's the reason. I mean, we would probably have loved to do it ourselves, but we don't have that team of 10 or 15 people uh, uh, that, that would, would be needed. So. That's where we are very uh, also uh, grateful uh, for the ELRC that, that they are doing this, this work for us. But this is also a kind of delicate issue to communicate to the, to the people in the, in the workshops. That why is the European Commission not here? Why is it some, some strange uh, companies or contractors? And this is what I, we try to uh, um, alleviate by signing the invitation, so on behalf of the European Commission, we invite to this event, which is co-organized by the Commission and this ELRC consortium. So that's, that's basically the distribution of roles between the Commission and the ELRC. The ELRC has certain contractual tasks uh, that if I just list the ones that I, I can remember, and then Josef will fill in if I, I forget something. So, ELRC shall maintain the website of the ELRC, that's clear. Uh, then they will have the secretariat. They will have a, a permanently, every day, every working day of the year, uh, somebody who is dealing with questions, emails and phone calls, and uh, uh, so keeping uh, a sort of, you know, the, the shop open. So we call it secretariat. Uh, they are coordinating these board meetings. Uh, they are coordinating the local workshops and making sure that the, the local workshops shops happen. So that's why uh, they, uh, they are issuing uh, these, uh, again, very modest, limited uh, contracts uh, for, for you to run the workshop in your country. There was a big discussion, actually, that should the ELRC organize, go to each country and organize the workshops there? It turned out that it is unrealistic. Uh, because they don't know the local, uh, they may know a few countries where they are located themselves, so that they are, they represent four, five countries in the consortium, but going to a, a stranger country where they have no connection would be just impossible. So that's why this um, distributed pattern was, was uh, set up. Then uh, finally, as I mentioned, legal assistance is a, is a contractual task of ELRC. Uh, then there's a consultation uh, task. What it means that if we, the Commission, or you in the member state, you have a technical issue. For example, how do I treat the Estonian or the Hungarian language? Because it's, it will not, empty at easy will not uh, work out. Can we use hybrid solution based on, on the uh, on the ECM, uh, MTATC or, or Moses, or do we have to purchase? This is a, a, an issue where you can say, okay, we need assistance, guidance on this, and ELRC will put a specialist working on that, and they will issue a report and work with you. Another question is that uh, I have, how do I do alignment of corpora? Because it's, it's a really big problem in my cases. They do not, these corpora, the, source sentences and the target sentences do not easily find each other in, in a parallel corpus. Please help us. So ELRC has uh, a task for that. Uh, for a limited number of consultation, uh, consultation assignments. Um, then they will do a certain number, certain amount of language resource collection and cleaning, but very limited very limited amount. So uh, it is actually future activities that we will specifically uh, launch call for proposals for future activities that will be dedicated. Uh, they will have a dedicated task to do that. And then finally, 
they have the task to organize two conferences. The first was, one was already at, in Riga, and second one is coming up. Did I forget any contractual time? Yet eight. I think you mentioned seven. I can't remember which one is missing, but it's pretty much. Yes. Yeah, the legal assistance yeah. and help desk goes together. I mean, that's it. So. Uh, right. Yes. So um, those are the tasks of the ELRC uh, contract, and I think it's it's actually fair fair now to outline them because I have been confronted also with some questions. What is the ELRC supposed to do before we jump into the into the dry runs of the presentations? Okay, and then I hope the rest of the questions will be answered in the in the next sessions. Yeah, maybe I can. If, if I may just add some practical uh, things that are being done within the project. If, if you look at the uh, generic uh, agenda that uh, Andrea shared with, uh, with you about the typical uh, workshop day, you will see that there is at least uh, four sessions that have the uh, title data or the term data in them. What kind of data, uh, what kind of practical issues, uh, how can we use them and so on. And uh, one of the tasks of the consortium is to set up a repository where we could store information about the sources of data. Where do we find data? In ministries, in embassies, in this URL, in this thing. So we do have a place where we can store this information for people that would like to harvest the data afterwards or to crawl it if, if they need to uh, get it from these sources. And then this is a channeled to a repository of resources, of language resources, where we do have documentation of what the resources is about. The language, is this corpora, is this uh, parallel corpora, is this a lexicon, is this what? And there we can also store the resources that are ready to, uh, to, uh, to use or to be used by a machine translation system. So these are tasks of the project, and if you look at the agenda, there is this uh, uh, four uh, tasks where we do have one that uh, elaborates on these sources and resources platforms. Uh, of course, the, uh, this is a, a generic presentation, but later on when I elaborate on some of this, I'll show you where the website is, what kind of uh, uh, platform we have and so on. And uh, we hope that this is the place that would be advertised for people who want to share these re uh, sources and resources with, uh, with you and with us. How does this link up with um, local uh, wishes to collect data? I mean, you are asking people to deliver data now to, to the DTT and to have these things stored in the cloud. But there might be lots of local companies who would like to use the data as well. And with the open data, I gather there is not a problem. But with the other data, of course, there are legal issues that have to be uh, solved. But um, how can we how can we uh, answer these questions in in the f in the forum when we are talking to people? Will they will they be able to also to get the data from you? Or will it be so that they have to make a sort of a parallel collection locally? And how is that going to work? Uh, as Kimo said, there is a legal uh, team uh, also involved in the project. And basically what we hope to get is the most open data possible. So if it's open, it means that the data will be used by the DGT or usable by DGT and beyond that. And we hope that all the open data will be used by the uh, European industry to make sure that we develop other technologies on the basis of that. Although this is not the mission of the or the mandate of the project, but of course open data will be kept open. Now it might happen that in some countries there is very useful data uh, that are, have some restrictions, like they have to be licensed under some specific licenses to the uh, European Commission, and we will make sure that this is done. And of course, this data will be restricted. But the primary target is to make sure that all the open data is open for everyone. Yeah. Uh, I can add to this. Yes, this is correct. So that um, uh, <coughs> so any language resources which, which are under license and that we have to license, and especially if 
the European Commission has to pay something for the license, a license fee, then we will obtain the license for that data to be used in the CEF program for the automated translation platform in the CEF. And I will later show in my slides what that means, where will it go, where it will be used. So that's clear because for, our, for us, the mandate of doing all this is to make the CEF public services, on online services, multilingual. But uh, the open data, I hope, will be a very important part of the data. And uh, it just happens that part of the CEF program, part of the same that is funding this automated translation, is also funding an, an open data portal. And uh, our unit is actually managing that, that uh, part as well. It's another colleague uh, in our unit. Um, and we publish all the open data in the open data portal. Uh, and we encourage other providers of open data to do the same. As an example, I can say that the most single most popular uh, uh, item in the open data portal so far has been the translation memories of, of, the, of the DGT, which have been published there since many years. Um, and that is a, a pattern that we would like love to see repeat and, and, and uh, in, uh, taking off uh, uh, in big scale because the member states would actually gain a lot by making their language data whenever they can to make it open data and publish it on the open data portal because it will improve the automated services, the level of the services that are, are available for their languages. Because all the language, resource, language service providers will use that, will download that open data and will uh, use it to make their services better, even beyond, of course, beyond the CEF uh, program. So that's the, but through the open data, I can, and I can see the possibility and the uh, opportunity to make the impact of your data wider than just the CEF uh, services. Otherwise, if it's restricted data, it will remain in the CEF services. Um. Well, um, I have a practical question. Uh, everybody knows that uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, data as it was initially published uh, to the data needed by uh, machine translation is quite a long way. Um, who would be responsible for preparing data uh, normalizing data, because uh, uh, at least in Romanian, there is a quite a frequent case that uh, diacriti diacritics are missing even, even in official documents, uh, which is outrageous. Uh, and, uh, well, who, who would do this work, which is a hell of a work? Another, may I just add another sentence to this question? Since um, we are talking about open data portal, which should be open to the data providers from all member states, who will uh, take care about the quality of translation, for instance? Because if we get the poor translations in the training material, of course we will produce the, the errors in the output particularly in the, in the case of uh, less resourced languages, where practically you can have a poorly translated documents of a document of five pages that will contaminate probably the translation model. Um, with in ELRC and under ELRC, given the coverage of the problem of the project and the resources of the project, there will be no extensive uh, data cleaning, um, uh, preparation, uh, etc. But initially we will collect, we will give a high level description we'll, which will also um, sort of like metadata on, on what we receive and we hope to do this jointly with you because sometimes we need to go back to you and ask you uh, because you're you're the experts. Um, and there will be some high level preparation and pre-processing of, uh, of the data. But depending on the volume and the spread of the data, ELRC cannot, um, cannot fully do all these pre-processing steps that are required in an ideal scenario. But our focus is on 
collecting data and on charting what is out there, even if we can't collect it. That's also very, very useful to know. And then with your help, identify those things that are not encumbered by IP rights too much, or if they are encumbered, do that in negotiation with the EC, leave it to the EC what, what they want to take, um, and then pass on whatever can be passed on under the IP rights and uh, the, uh, under sufficient quality uh, to the EC. The EC has also pipelines internally uh, where they do data pre-processing, uh, but again, I, I think that will, be, uh, that will be limited. So at the moment, it's not the case that, that we have a data factory or anything like this uh, running. It's really like seeing what is out there, what is available, uh, what can be provided, also relying on your guidance, on your expertise, um, on your judgment where you say, yes, this is not encumbered by any IP rights, but it has problems X, Y, and Z. Then we would take it and we would document this in our metadata and still pass it on to the EC. Um, and then, um, yeah, leave the decision with the uh, EC as to whether it's advisable to put further resources because it might be a big chunk of data that if it was in good shape would be extremely useful uh, to put money into further pre-process. If I may add just a word, uh, w we mentioned the potential participants to the workshops. These are public sector representatives who are producing reports that in many cases are official reports. So I th we assume that in 99% of the cases, if such reports have been published or have been circulated within the local administration and so on, the quality is what we expect. But of course, this might be uh, a mistake and we can imagine that some pre-draft or whatever are circulated just for information and the interview of the, uh, uh, the uh, providers who are donating the data would help us assess whether it's really high quality, something that has been published and we can just assume it's uh, the things we expect or it's a draft that has been circulated internally and then it's up to the commission to uh, check if they use it in the uh, translation system uh, as it is or with some pre-processing. Uh, um, just, just add to that, so we have uh, initial experience in receiving data sets and um, these data sets in some cases come from translation offices uh, and of course they're extremely good judges of the quality. Uh, in this case, like in one German case, it's a translation memory uh, and that is already sentence aligned. These are really high quality human translations and, uh, and sources. So, so that's kind of like um, an ideal situation uh, where it's in already in a format that's very close. It can be automatically processed and fed into machine translation pipeline because some of the other things that need to be done to this uh, data are available like in a Moses pipeline or in similar uh, pipelines and they can be done automatically. But the important thing is like we really are uh, our task is to catalog everything and to also collect and pass on because ELSC will not keep any data. Uh, it's only sort of like a transit. So we have a data repository with, where we keep data for, I don't know, a couple of days or weeks or something like that to complete the metadata annotation often together with you and then it's passed on to, uh, to the EC. Um, um, it, the, the objective is really to find everything that's out there and that is potentially useful even in cases where this cannot be fully judged or there are quite a few question mark on, on, on the usefulness. Um, so apart from these workshops having the tasks of making uh, creating awareness in the uh, local public institutions about the importance of collecting these data, it seems now that there is also a kind of process going on where they also actually have to deliver some of the data. And, and you also said something about markup or metadata and involving us. And so I'm quite a bit confused of how much do you actually expect from us apart from making the workshop happening, bringing people together, which is what I un understood from the contract. And then afterwards, uh, how is this process organized when people are actually willing to share some data? My impression was that this was sort of a kind of a next step and and uh, now it seems to me that we are sort of crawling into that not that i don't want to do it but it's it's i know it's quite a lot of work and and i also think that that there should be a clear borderline as where are we going to stop and and when is the next phase where we are going to assist you with other things 
that's an important, a really, really crucial point that you raised there. Um, so from our experience, it has become very, very clear um, that it doesn't stop at the workshops. At the moment, your mandate is only the workshop. If you look at the subcontract, and already for that, you're not resourced well. Like 5,000 is really like, um, it's by, by a hair's breadth. If you're very, very careful, if you manage to get a really nice room for free, if, if you have to pay for the room, it gets very, very, very tight. Um, you, some of you might have uh, good connections with um, simultaneous interpreters. You might get a special price, but if you if you pay full commercial rates, this is this will definitely exhaust the uh, the budget. At the same time, it's becoming extremely clear from our experience from running the the first uh, three workshop that it doesn't stop at the workshop. Uh, the workshop sort of like opened the door a tiny little bit. Uh, and then a lot of work sort of like has to happen and, and, and follow on uh, afterwards. And that's the follow-up, the customer care. Kind of like, you know, a month after the workshop, uh, sending materials, contacts again, thanking people and asking them, yeah, okay, you know, if you're, you're the director of, um, the, of the archival unit, uh, for example, in this uh, ministry, you have a lot of resources, but the person who decides is actually somebody else in the ministry who's uh, the, director of, the director of the archival uh, unit. And can you, can you uh, be a conduit. Can you pass on? Can you pass us on to that particular person so that we can negotiate uh, with them? And that there has to be again there has to be a very substantial local ownership and involvement, um, doing something for your local language, uh, because we can't kind of like from DFKI in in, in Germany um, call Tattoo or something like this and say like you know oh, but, you know thank you for being at the workshop. We weren't there ourselves, it was run by, by your local uh, national anchor point, and can we now have your data? That doesn't work. So within the project, we are now looking how to best support uh, a follow-on action, which is the customer care, uh, the, the local person um, having that right phone call, um, uh, etc. And I think that's extremely useful. All the rest, we would take over. You know, the machinery uploading, uh, the legal advice, uh, etc. Uh, also, the metadata annotation, so it's very, very high level. Maybe uh, Khalid can say a little bit about uh, that. Uh, we would refer back to you. So we don't want you to, I don't know, identify named entities or something like that. It's really just meta. It's like, what's the genre? You know, how big is the resource in, 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 in bytes or word counts or something like that? It's, it's really at, uh, um, at that level. Maybe some quality judgment, if you can, can give it, and, and we will. Uh, we'll look at it uh, as well, but it's really at uh, at that level, and we would come back to you if we're stuck, if uh, if we cannot judge this, and then um, we'll have to take it on a one-to-one -one basis. If if you can do this, um, if you can't do this, if you don't have the resources yourself, of course we have to uh, have to accept that. Well, I mean, in in our case, for instance, I would rather cooperate with our local Clarin uh, group and asking them, I mean, they have the resources and they have actually ways of, of putting these things into a format that can be done. I mean, I wouldn't be able to do, to do that in my little institution. And, and I mean, looking at data that comes from some kind of ministry and judging what genre it is and what quality it has, no way. I mean, I wouldn't be able to do that at all. So, so I mean, that's, I think that is completely impossible. It might be possible if I could involve the local people that are working with Clarin, for instance, and saying, okay, you have a chance now to upload this into your, your uh, resource database. How do you think about that? So, first of all, you have been carefully selected, handpicked, because you are people that can make things happen. You have the networks, like you know the Clarin people, and uh, you can make things happen. So, the best use of you, your scarce resources, your, yourself, your working time, is that you concentrate on the human relations in your country, your network, so that you can make things happen. And we do all the rest. We may not be able to do it <laughs> immediately for, for next week, but you don't have to worry about it. So, uh, I mean, processing or uh, cleaning up uh, or negotiating a licensing option. It's something that if you establish the contact and you make start to, uh, you can make it happen that things start to flow uh, 
or, or, or uh, rather that there's an avalanche of, of resources that would be that would be ideal. Don't worry too much about uh, the post processing because as I said we have upcoming uh, new uh, resources for uh, uh, for contracts for uh, procurement and even for collaborative grant projects that are resourced to do that. We have 8 million euro funding in the, in the next uh, uh, work program in the next round uh, that we are going to launch very soon. And we will have even slightly even more, if we are lucky, 10, uh, 12, 13 million in the, in the following uh, work program on these activities. But it will take time until it's all started, but resources are there. You are doing this important uh, pioneering work now. Yeah, actually, we are just like the first step. We now just we try to find um, the sources, and this is already quite uh, quite a task. And then there comes the second step. <laughs> uh, um, a lot of information that comes with some of the resources because they come from the translation unit, and and they tell us this is the genre, that's the quality, this is the translation. But of course, it will be very uh, varied, and and some might be the exact opposite. Yeah. Uh, Mike. I have a very practical question related to the to the conference that we're, we're, the, um, we are doing because I, I feel we are now digging into the to the or to the DSI of the SEF, uh, that, that the automatic translation. And uh, uh, I I have a very practical question. I've seen some dates proposed for the for the conference in Norway. Is these dates fixed by you, or is it something which we can can uh, can uh, do something about, move them around. The other thing is, uh, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about the simultaneous translation. I've uh, arranged a number of conferences in Norway. We never had any simultaneous translation. It's been EU conferences uh, and these things. So uh, this seems a very complex uh, thing, sort of being adding on to, to how we would normally have, have done this. So is this mandatory op thing from your side, or, or, or how should I look at that? answer that question quickly. Yes, the um, simultaneous translation, I mean, it, it's a must um, because the workshop should be in, in the local language. So uh, I'm afraid that uh, that uh, it would be difficult just to say, okay, we, we I would not see how, how else to do it. Um, yeah, it's uh, uh, at the moment we have very good experiences from that. And we had a need because, uh, for example, in the Greek workshop, Many presentations, of course, most presentations were in Greek, but some presentations were in English. Um, and while the Greek presentations were going on, we had representatives from the EC, uh, but also from the ELRC, from the, uh, from the contractor, from us. Um, and then the Greek um, presentations were translated back into the English, even though there's a version of the master slides available in the English. And the same in Germany and the same in, um, uh, in Riga. Um, and um, I think, yeah, I'd, if if there is a language gap, we have to bridge it, and we have to make sure that there's no English presentation that is not translated into the two Norwegian languages. I don't know. Well, uh, that and way yeah, is easy, yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 And we had, I mean, just uh, this is slightly b behind, uh, beside the point, but we had amazing uh, simultaneous translators. So in, Gre in Greece, for example, one of the translators was, uh, uh, she's Alexis uh, Tsipras, a uh, translator, uh, tr uh, interpreter with the EU negotiation. It was amazing. It was really amazing. And there's always two. They do handshakes because it's so tiring and exhausting. Because at a conference like this, somebody's talking all the time. And this has to be covered by two people in two, two languages. And they can switch these languages and they do handshakes every 10 minutes. And uh, yeah, it was, it was quite, an, quite an experience and a very positive experience. And Actually, it is even um, for the discussions, it's extremely, well, it's needed just to have this um, translation because we are, um, or we will be speaking very likely in, in at least two different languages, like English and uh, the national local language. So just to be able to communicate and to discuss together and to answer questions, um, it's inevitable, we, we need it. Um, also hints and tips 
<coughs> because translation services or interpretation services, it is expensive. So um, whatever kind of contacts you have, um, as, as um, Josef said um, in, uh, in Greek, um, we had this really great connection for the interpreters, um, what we did in Germany. Um, um, where we are closely um, related to the university, there they have um, a unit for, um, well for, for interpreters or for, for educating interpreters, and then we got in touch with them. So we actually, um, I think this is always um, doable, but if, if you need any help or if you have yeah. any questions. It's a, it's a lot of money, but it's, know. yeah. So thank you, it was very clarifying, and it was very different from what I was thinking this morning, so, so it clarifies a lot. And it makes uh, the event much more complicated than what I imagined coming down yesterday. So thank you. Uh, I have uh, two questions. One is very uh, practical, but uh, I think that's important uh, to find a, a nice uh, and a cheap location, <laughs> for instance. Uh, from your previous experience of the previous workshop, What's the number of participants uh, which are expected uh, to the meetings? Because, uh, you know, um, as uh, Andrea was saying, it's not uh, nice to have uh, two big rooms with few people or two crowded rooms with... Uh, so this was my question. Can I do both <laughs> questions? And the second question was uh, about the typology of resources to be... of language resources to be collected. Because so far we have been speaking of uh, corpora, and uh, and uh, and maybe also terminologies and lexicons. So th this is what I, I understood. The situation of Italy is that uh, I have been checking with people in public administrations. Most part of uh, Italian texts are in Italian only. So Itali Italy, if can contribute to this, uh, will contribute mainly through uh, monolingual corpora. And uh, we can get maybe some multilingual corpora, with uh, so preferably also parallel corpora, from uh, uh, those regions uh, in Italy which has a special status, so, and uh, they have uh, more than one official language, uh, like uh, Trentino Alto Adige, for instance. So I will obviously, we will contact them, because at least uh, we have a chance uh, to have this parallel corpora. But uh, one issue that uh, you raised uh, during the answers was the, the, the topic of uh, the genre of the texts to be collected, because uh, uh, they can be laws, they can be uh, directives, they can be, uh, we call them circolari. So the target of these documents can be the citizen, can be, can be another public administration. For instance, uh, you f before mentioned the uh, public relations offices. So public relations typically have a target, the citizen. And so I think uh, all in, the, in, these old, in these cases, uh, the kind of language to be used is different. So my question was, uh, this could be handled uh, through the metadata, but I think uh, this is the typical question we get when we go to them. What kind of text do you need? And so Many important questions. And I'll start and then hand over to uh, Khalid. Um, so the first question was the number of participants, so in Berlin 50 plus, in Athens 100 plus, in Riga, yeah, 59, 50 plus. Um, so and I think anything above 50 would be uh, wonderful. And in, in some cases, um, so we found in Greece there was a lot of response. I mean, r a lot of interest. Uh, also, like NGOs, to mention another one, the National Greek Bank uh, participated, because uh, these are institutions that are um, operating internationally, and the, 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 what is the standards, offices, etc. There's a long list of, um, of uh, we, I think what we can, we may be able to share maybe an anonymized version of the participation lists with, with that just list affiliations, and that might be a useful a guide for where to go fishing. Um, I think the, uh, the types of data, yes, monolingual data is extremely important for the language models. Um, we find that many, uh, the terminologies, uh, concept hierarchies, uh, uh, there are, uh, I mean, some, some ministries are really surprising. They have, because they deal internationally, they have even multilingual concept hierarchies, and some are also standardized through the EU, and they, they already exist, they're, they're, they're nothing uh, new. Um, and I think, fine, yeah, the, the regional, um, the border 
areas often or certain regional areas are highly interesting and this will come out in, in one of the uh, presentations um, and uh, there will often be naturally occurring by text translated texts also in substantial uh, volumes in some countries there's more than one official language so in Ireland with Irish with English in Belgium there's uh, uh, French Dutch and German actually um, and there's a, a couple of more, Luxembourg, for, for example, these will be very, very valuable. Uh, the northern Italian regions, for uh, example, come to mind. Um, so these are all good places to fish, like the, the border regions. And finally, we'll take anything at this stage, any quality, um, but um, it's kind of like, yeah, I think, yeah. So uh, I think Joseph said already, we are looking for anything, corpora, lexica, terminology, ontologies, whatever, monolingual, bilingual, multilingual, uh, any uh, genre that represent the public sector jargons, uh, and I'm using the proler, because uh, different ministries from social security to uh, foreign affairs may have different jargons and different way of uh, writing things. And you will be very surprised uh, to, to see how much data the public sector has. It's really amazing. Uh, if, if we uh, keep talking about Italian, if you look at the Italian embassy in Madrid, uh, the first thing is Embajada de Italia in Madrid, and it's Spanish. And uh, I'm sure that uh, if we uh, look at the uh, uh, Italian embassy in Estonia, it would be very likely Estonian, uh, and a number of reports that the embassy or the ambassador feel important for Estonian people or Estonian market would be translated in Estonian without the Italians of Italy knowing about it. So this is the kind of things that we will after. And I hope we will find a lot of that. Okay, so um, <clears throat> one of the uh, issues which I think has been underplayed a little bit here is, first of all, I mean, some public administrations are more, more friendly about supplying data than others. Um, and in the cases where, as in, 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 in our own case, the, the general attitude towards providing data is, we can't do this, this is not, this is not something we can do, it's, it's, it's not, not available, or they, a million excuses are made why they shouldn't be supplying public, public data, um, public administration data. Um, are there, I mean, in, in the experience you've had so far with workshops, are there good arguments that one can provide whereby, um, you can say that if you supply this data, good things will follow. And what sort of good things should we say? Because I think one wants to be, has to be very careful between promising too much and promising nothing. And if you just say, we'll take anything, they're gonna say, well, what, what for? So I think one has to get that right. First of all, we don't want to be too uh, prescriptive uh, to start with, because then we will end up nothing. And people will say, well, I have lots of things, but I don't have exactly the kinds that you are looking for now. Secondly, we may be wrong if we say that we are only looking for this kind of, actually we might uh, discover something useful in material which at first sight doesn't look, uh, or uh, doesn't look so um, useful. Um, thirdly, it's important to establish where gaps exist. So if there is total absence of parallel corpora in Denmark or in Italy, so everything is in it Italian. Uh, if that's really true, then we have to do something uh, to fill that gap by a, by, uh, a dedicated action with budget for, for that language. Then uh, if that really proves to be the case, we hope that will not be the case for all languages, uh, but we will be ha having to fill many gaps and we first have to learn what the gaps are before we can start filling them. So getting anything from the member states will give us a very important uh, information of the typology of the language resources that are held by public authorities and how much of that is open data and how much of the useful resources are open data and how much of them are, are closed data and we should actually pay something for them or and how much of them are uh, not existing that we have to create somehow. Yeah. Now about the, uh, the framework, uh, there is a clear uh, directive from the European uh, Commission uh, that has been transposed in local law 
that's called the Public Sector Initiative, and we are probably at the third release. I will say a few words when talking about the legal framework. So basically, uh, all European countries, or most of the European countries, have in their law uh, regulations that forces, uh, encourages, to be fair, the uh, public sector uh, agencies to release the, their data under these open licenses. So the data goes from geographic, from statistic, from whatever, to languages. So this is the framework. So we do have the legal framework under which we are working. Uh, but again, even if the data is there and people are happy to, uh, to uh, release it, the best option is to have a win-win deal with them to make sure that they get something, as, as, as Kimo said. And the big challenge is how to convince them that working towards this machine translation system is an important issue for the language. So uh, we all know that there is fears, that there is concerns, that the quality issues and all these things, that's what we need to discuss frankly and honestly with everyone. Yeah. So uh, Khalid is right, we do have a law in place which obliges in principle public administration to, to share, publish their data, uh, data, their data which is not personal data of course. Um, However, I do not believe in, in coercion. So uh, we, we can only make people collaborate by giving them tools and by helping them, not by saying, going to them and say, by the way, you have to share this data, otherwise you will go to court. So this we will not do. <laughs> uh, we will not be very popular and people will disappear from our workshops very quickly if the, the word spreads that we are doing that. Uh, it's good to know about, so it's good that you reminded that there is a legal framework uh, and some member states are, are very aware of this obligation and uh, some of them are taking it very seriously, others are slower. But I think the best way to make that happen, so the data sharing happen, is actually first of all to work with the forerunners, those that are, are the first one to, to sh sh share everything and then show the example to the others and secondly by providing assistance and tools and our open data portal hopefully will be a tool uh, for public institutes to easily to publish uh, their open data uh, without coercion so i, I don't believe in in uh, forceful <laughs> actions in this now yeah. okay okay i i have uh, several practical questions but let's uh, get back to the goal of the workshop and the more general questions which may seem unpopular here but i have to ask them so uh, the first question is about the whole idea of the workshop so what uh, is it more about advertising the concept of cf uh, at and uh, if it's so what are we really advertising it's is it a service is it uh, a service that's uh, planned to be developed in the future or it's all already there I don't think so. Or we are just advertising the idea of making the data open. And if it's, if it's just that, that's probably too general. Uh, and we are doing it for, for years now. So, or it's just about the gathering the real data. And uh, if so, it could be approached in so many ways that uh, it, it needs some clarification, I guess. So I don't expect people to come and say, here is our data, please take it and do whatever you want. It, it was really difficult to get data from people, especially the translation data, translation memories, for example. And the uh, even more delicate thing is, uh, what, what's the model of cooperation? So we are supposed to be the national anchor points uh, and uh, it looks to me as we are having a project without without a contract, a project without a project. So it's similar to MetaNet, so we are, we are talking about gathering data, uh, um, processing it, uh, filling metadata, so it's all the same all over again, uh, without the money it involved. Sorry to say that. Uh, and it's not just the money for us, but uh, it's the money for, for example, for data providers, because sometimes, uh, in, in case of Poland, we were paying people to provide their data, to make their parallel corpora available. And it really helped. I liked the idea a lot. Probably, well, everyone was happy with it. Uh, so, uh, and even, even without that, uh, if we are going to be the national anchor points, uh, there will be people coming to us, and are we supposed to, uh, well, to, to do it just in our free time, or uh, there is going to be some follow-up uh, about that? So, 
Uh, and uh, at the end, one practical question, maybe, but it's, it's all related. So uh, it's going to be, in our case, all in Polish, I guess, the presentations. I hope we can get Aleksandra Wesołowska, for example. I don't know uh, whether she's still working for the EC. I hope so. Uh, uh, so it, it can be in Polish, but there will be uh, in Polish, but there will be some ELL, uh, ELRC people involved because you have all these wonderful master slides and some, some of the concepts have to be in English because they are already prepared and uh, well the explanation of what uh, Kimo is going to explain us, for example, the multilinguality and such things, it, it's all prepared very professionally and I would like to see it in English, to hear it in English. Uh, it, it w is it going to be a mixture? Will there be people from your side answering questions that will appear or we are supposed to do it? If so, I don't have enough information to answer all the questions that may arise. Answer the, the last question because that's very easy to answer. Yes, there will be in every uh, workshop somebody from the ELRC. And uh, we try also uh, for most of the events to have a commission uh, representative present. If it's not possible, uh, we try to establish a video link so that there can be a video presentation uh, and uh, participation remotely. Um, okay, uh, there is a whole presentation about uh, the important point that you mentioned, what are the advantages for the participant that come to your workshops, why do, why do I come here? And it's true that it's a, uh, it is not immediately obvious, so it's not mainly advertising the, the CEF program, because that's very abstract, uh, that will be difficult, mm, uh, but I would say the immediate uh, maybe benefit is for the uh, member states is that uh, we at the Commission, we are operating a machine translation service which serves all, in principle, all the EU languages. And for some languages it doesn't work very well. Maybe for the Polish, English into Polish doesn't work very well. With this oper common uh, exercise we can make it better. And we give it to you free of charge. So we give the MTATC system and then the later when it becomes more than MTATC, we give it to the member state administrations, at least the public administrations, free of charge. So uh, at least as long as we have funding uh, th through the CEF program, we can never uh, foresee, uh, predict what happens after 2020 and th when the program ends, but at least until then. So that's a concrete promise you can make. And, uh, uh, so they can use the way they, they, they want, the, the MT service to, for, for messaging, for translating snippets of text or translating documents. Uh, um, then, of course, there will have to be also uh, some you know, education or some information given about the CEF program, what it's really aiming, because that's not the primary aim of the CEF automated translation program, it's actually to make these pan-European uh, digital services multilingual. The problem is that these, in mo many most cases, do not yet exist, these pan-European uh, um, services. Some of them exist, that some of them are actually well known. European digi digital library exists, but it is, it is multilingual, but it is not cross-lingual. So I cannot easily use cross-lingual search and then I make it a document in Polish which I may not understand. So we, we will make these platforms like Europeana, like the e-justice portal online for your citizens, for the citizens of your country. But as I said, this is already a bit more abstract promise because it's mm -hmm. far in the future. It will not happen in one year, not in maybe in two years something will be in place, but it will take several years until it's fully operational. Um, maybe, maybe just to add, um, I think the vision is important. We are in the digital age, we know, we see language technologies more and more around us, whether we like it or not, uh, and we would like to support our languages as best as possible, and in this case Polish. And we have an opportunity to do this. And I think that should be a strong motivator. I know it's a bit sort of like airy fairy and, and everything, but it's happening around us. It's the big companies that are doing it, etc. And in Europe, the EC is a big player because it supports multilinguality and thereby all the individual languages. But to get the best data for the individual language, the, that data is held by, by the people that speak these languages. 
So I think that is really, really important, and, and that spirit behind it uh, is important. Um, in addition to the practical benefits, that there will be systems that are trained for Polish, that are honed on public services because they've been trained with public service data, etc., and that may make them more useful uh, in, in, in the day-to-day -day interaction uh, between governments and citizens, uh, Polish citizens, but citizens across Europe. You know, there might be a Polish person stranded in Spain, and of course these systems, uh, you know, will, will also be available uh, to, uh, to Spain, and that, that might give better interaction uh, in, in, in that particular case. Um, the final thing I wanted to mention is, is the more sort of like, I don't know how to say this, um, uh, self-interest um, that we have as a community. Um, I think if this is successful, to some extent, uh, it is visible within the EC and, and actually the highest levels within the EC. If this fails, kind of like, you know, the CEF and supporting the languages across Europe, um, uh, the, the people high up in the EC will say, yeah, language technologies, we tried this, now we'll leave that to Google and Microsoft and like, you know, because we tried it and it doesn't work. Okay, but here we have a chance to contribute. Um, and this is also in our interest. And that's why, kind of like, you have been carefully selected because you are the language technology experts, you are the people from the ministries who have huge experience already in some cases. I think France is an example. Uh, uh, I think there, there are very experienced people in the, in the ministries that know about machine translation, that have deep knowledge about this, that have evaluated it, that have looked at this, uh, et cetera. So it's a huge opportunity. And we have to get that, that spirit across as well. And on top of it all, we have this extremely rare win-win situation where you know we, we can be um i don't know how you say this it, like you know, uh, focused on ourselves and our languages but doing that providing additional resources uh, for our languages will actually help europe you know and vice vice versa helping europe is actually supporting our languages supporting europe is supporting our languages um, and and i think it's an important part of the workshop is to get that across mm -hmm. um. can, you, can you address can you address the question uh, that uh, Mashish asked uh, about the, uh, we are going to work without a project, without a contract, and without funding. I think it's really important. Uh, the, what we planned within the project is the workshops. And as Joseph said, there is, uh, well, we can debate that, a small budget for, to cover the cost of the workshop. And then what we do expect is all this networking activity that we expect everyone to carry. Uh, not only on behalf of the project or on behalf of the commission, it's really, as, as Joseph said, we would like to support our languages and we would like you to liaise with the public sector people and every, if everyone feels that having these uh, technologies is worth it, I'm sure that we will uh, have volunteers. But again, we don't expect you afterwards to conduct any practical work like I think Simonita mentioned, or uh, Dan mentioned cleaning, processing, aligning, correcting, and things like that. Whatever requires funding and uh, human resources, either it's doable within the project or we leave it out. But, but you, don't have, you will not be asked to clean the Romanian data or the Polish data to align it and, and things like that, unless we have the funding to support that kind of task. Yes. We and what I also want to add is that anyways, you know, we, we are there to help. So for instance, there's Khalid, um, who's responsible for the technical and legal help desk. So if there are any issues, let's say you, you have someone from the workshop who said, okay, maybe I have something of interest, you know, please just um, do, do let us know. I mean, we are there to help. We are there to answer any legal or to help you with any legal um, technical questions. Even with just um, getting the data um, from, from there to here. Um, that's what we are there for. So you, you're definitely not alone. And we, we try to, to, to help you with really as much as we can. Okay, so just, just one, uh, one last sentence. It's more about the vision than about anything concrete now, yes? I think you have to give both. Uh-huh. Uh, yes, because some people, some people are inspired the vision, others are, are only want to have uh, immediate benefits. Okay, and uh, where, when uh, is this CEF uh, service going to be operational, or it's already there? Uh, in a sense, it's already there, uh, that uh, since uh, operational since 2013, if you think of uh, the MT at EC system. Mm -hmm. It's not only a document translation system, it also has been ported to a number of uh, online services uh, so that it's been plugged to 
uh, for example, the IMI, the Internal Market in Information System, where it provides the online uh, translation of free text between the member state administrations. So, uh, we are not going to show it, just to demonstrate that it's already there and it needs to be better or... Uh, you mean demonstrate the MTATC system? Yes. Uh, that may be possible to arrange. Yep. Uh, and depends on if it's if it's a priority topic, it, it may be possible to arrange it because uh, you have the user uh, the connection to it, and uh, it's just a matter of technical arrangement. Actually, at the German workshop, what we did, we, we offered, um, but it was announced up front. So if people are interested, just to, <coughs> to provide some texts, <coughs> and um, in the breaks they could hand it over to us. And we, we, we just had it translated, I mean, just for, for people to see, okay, what is the status of the system? So what is the output? Um, this is um, something which you could also offer as part of your workshop. So there was the one more question there, and then questions. Thank you. I have two questions. One is if the new data bank will contain also the data of the European Commission for uh, which con about the data of European Commission of le le European legislation that now you have. If it's it's one question, and then the other is which form uh, the data have. It's it's possible also that it's only the websites. For example, we have websites for foreigners in many languages, but we don't have it in. For, for words form. Mm -hmm. I, I can maybe respond to the second part of your uh, uh, question. Um, in parallel to the activities that um, that are visible and uh, that have been represented in the workshops, uh, we also do web crawling. And we do that, uh, this is automatic web crawling, so we, we target certain ministries and then we send the crawlers out, so we have uh, very good technology support from ILSP, but also from Elda Elra, and also from Tilde. Um, and this information we use um, in order to focus our, uh, our, our engagement. Mm -hmm. and, and we also find the materials, because if they are available on the web pages, then to first approximation, they're probably public, um, and we can use that, but, but we'll check that. Uh, now, having said that, even though this is very valuable and it, it gives us a first indication of where uh, are people that we should talk to, because what we find with the web crawling might just be the tip of the iceberg. There might be so much documentation within the institution that doesn't surface on the official web pages for a number of reasons. And some might be good IP reasons, etc., so they might not be available, etc. But um, the, the crawl data is already useful. In some cases, getting even the translation memories, if it was tr professional translation that produced these web, uh, web pages, is even more useful, because then we don't have to do automatic alignment, uh, et cetera. There's may maybe metadata annotations already available with these translation memories. Uh, so, so that's very, very useful. Um, I think, and, and helps us, and we can also provide that service for you, for your country, <coughs> so if you, if you say us, uh, tell us, yeah, this is very useful, then we and we have a couple of sort of like ministries that you identify. We could run these web crawlers and supply the results to you. Um, that might be very useful. Um, and then for the legal memories, I hand over to Ken. Uh, so, do, do you mean when you said EU legislation? Do you mean the the legislation of the European Union yeah, or of the of the member state? Yes. Okay. That's already part of, uh, that, that we have already. Yeah. And uh, uh, so uh, the empty at easy system is based on this. So it has been trained on this dat data, which make it suitable for translating this type of text, but maybe not su so suitable for other types of text. And, and uh, actually it's only half truth. The, the empty at easy system is trained not only on the URLEC, what you find in URLECs, yeah. that's only <coughs> a fraction. It's also trained on all the internal documents and all the intermediary versions of the documents that never get published. It's everything that is uh, moving within the commission, within the DGT, which is much more than what gets published. 
uh, that it's 10 times or even more l larger uh, amount of multilingual corpora. So, uh, but yes, yeah, so that's part of the system already. Yeah, and this will be accessible for the member states. Yes, so the, it, it will be, if you mean the data, uh, yes, the data, data. the, the Urlex data, you can actually find it in a, in a very useful format. Uh, don't go to Urlex, but uh, go to uh, the open data portal where you can download the translation memories of the DGT because they are fully aligned and immediately usable there. But it's the, it's the same data, it's the Urlex data in, a, in an aligned form. A huge, yes. it's a very big okay. data bank in a good quality. But now it's not possible to every everybody yeah. to use it because it's it's too difficult for the people who are working on the ministry to use mm -hmm. uh, use it. Yes. So maybe it, this is a more of a technical question yeah. of where will it be stored and, yeah. and kept, yeah. and whether it's all going to be stored and kept in the same place in a, in a huge. Data bank. So uh, we have not yet fully analyzed this question, uh, but we, uh, uh, first of all, uh, there are different scenarios possible so that we, we only create a sort of metadata repository where we don't keep the data itself, only the information about what data there is and, and, and where it is located. And then, uh, but you are right that w if you want to develop like an empty system or, or, a, or a translation memory system, you have to put the data in the same place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all data that you want to use for the training of the system, at least for that moment when you are training the system, it must be physically in the same place. And for that, we are setting up these cloud uh, resources because we, we have um, you know, uh, not enough uh, servers, not enough space mm -hmm. in our computers to do that when it happens. So in the future, this is not, this is not a need that exists uh, for the time being because, uh, but we expect this will arise when we receive large amounts of data sets and then we want to train the system, the machine translation system on that data. We need a single place, a data <coughs> base uh, where to put it all. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we are currently, you know, arranging that possibility. It will be part. It will also be funded uh, through the CEF program to create this sort of uh, large um, storage and processing space. And and will that storage and processing space will be, can it be used by the member states? That's an interesting question. Maybe we can we can uh, look into that. How you could. Uh, yeah. Um, how you could link to that that space uh, because th th but that's something I'll take note of that but we haven't really been uh, discussing it yet only about mm -hmm. how much storage space we need so that's we have been discussing because it determines how much it costs uh, so the, the, the terabytes ha are have been discussed how much we need but that's an interesting question of maybe it's there should be a sort of collaborative space so that it is uh, can be used by by all the stakeholders uh, yeah. i have two quick questions maybe then we can discuss uh, <laughs> during the break uh, then uh, the answers i'm going back to the uh, typology of text uh, question because uh, as uh, kimorosi was saying uh, uh, the machine translation system uh, at uh, which is uh, running uh, currently has been trained on EU directives. Is, is it true? Mm. Okay, I'm saying that because uh, we, uh, in our institute, uh, we have a group uh, who have been uh, studying the um, public administration language uh, in Italy. Mm. Okay, so I can tell you that uh, it's extremely important to have a, uh, to know what kind of texts or, or to collect. Because, for instance, I know 
and I have papers that demonstrate that, that the Italian uh, of European directives is much, much closer to usual everyday language in Italy than the law language of used in national laws. <coughs> so if we specialize the machine translation system to deal with the uh, laws, then it will be impossible to use it uh, for translating other types of texts. That, uh, that's, uh, that I'm sure, because, uh, you know, and so I think uh, we, at least in this first phase uh, in which we gather texts, I think it's important uh, to uh, classify resources also with the this kind of information. And also, I think our role is also to <coughs> provide you with this kind of information, because uh, Maybe uh, this is not the case in all uh, countries, but in, Ita in Italy, it, uh, laws are uh, really obscure, and uh, that's uh, obscure, linguistically speaking, okay? And uh, so, uh, I think, and uh, the other question was, uh, uh, you, you said that uh, we, we should emphasize the fact that uh, we should, uh, say that uh, ma machine translation services exist already and we can make it, make it better. But uh, we also know that uh, that's, if that's a promise uh, in many years, it's not uh, just uh, a quick uh, promise. So my approach when I was thinking about my workshop in Italy was uh, that it could be useful for public administrators to see some uh, intermediate benefits and uh, obviously it's not uh, your action that can give uh, this kind of benefits. But uh, I think uh, we could uh, frame this uh, broader, uh, broader goal in, uh, and, uh, I, with uh, some intermediate steps that uh, the national community and services, that the national computational linguistics community could uh, provide uh, to the public administrations. So, uh, so far in the actors, uh, main actors of the wor workshops, uh, I think it seems uh, there is a public administrations and uh, the us, us, us uh, as a Euro ELRC uh, and the, the national anchor as a, a representative, as a, a, a bridge between the ELRC and the public administration. For Italy, I would like to enlarge and uh, to involve the, a third community, which is the community of uh, computational language technologies. Because I think uh, that could help the people from public administration to understand uh, why uh, this is useful in the longer pers perspective. So for instance, in Italy, uh, there are initiatives uh, um, uh, towards uh, simplification of public administration language. And I think these are important also in the direction of a machine translation because uh, that's a prerequisite also to have a higher quality translation. And why not to give them access? Or for instance, there are pilot projects involving uh, universities and the public administrations on uh, uh, collecting corpora uh, in, of public administration. So we have already this uh, corpora and uh, to enabling uh, to use uh, to accessing uh, contents on the, the basic of sem semantics. So I think uh, in your, uh, but maybe today we can sp speak more about it, but uh, uh, it seems that among the workshop contents there is a, a one slot uh, devoted to languages and language technologies in the country. I think for Italy, it, at least for in my view of things, it should be something not uh, quite abstract, uh, you know, one day we will have, but uh, I think we should make, uh, frame the long-term goal uh, more uh, 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 concrete in some respect. Many, many important points raised. Um, I think the last one, making it relevant, concrete, that section, we did that in Germany with Alex Weibel doing a life system, a university system that translates speech into, um, and that, that came across really, really well. And people also saw the limitations because they had the simultaneous translation, which of course is better uh, than, uh, but that's important to realize as well. But it's also important to see the technology. Like this morning, no, no, yesterday evening in a taxi, the taxi driver didn't punch in the address into the system. He just spoke. He said, Kannstraße 10, Berlin, boom. 
you know, of the, the car drove. And it's, it's our, and we don't want our languages to end up in digital oblivion. So, so important. The other thing, domain tuning, of course, extremely uh, uh, important, extremely necessary. Uh, it, there cannot be one machine translation, at least a statistical one, for all domains. Uh, they're, they're not just, they're just not like that by their nature. Uh, Kimo already mentioned uh, uh, this, and there will be specific systems tuned to certain domains. Machine translation can be very obscure, so it can be close to, to laws. I mean, that's a bit flippant, uh, of course. There are very sophisticated techniques now uh, where you can exploit any kind of data. It doesn't have to be domain specific, but there are algorithms such as, I don't know, difference in cross entropy or something like that, that allow to pick from the stuff that's not domain adequate, that subset that actually fits. And we can do this automatically, and DGT can do this automatically, and Ceph AT can do this automatically. So yes, we need to, ha to have domain-tuned system, but we need everything, all the data. Let the systems decide, let the algorithms decide if we know what we're targeting. Uh, the last one, computational linguistics, natural language processing community involved, really, really good idea. The challenge is to make them speak the same language with our colleagues from the public administrations, who are often very high-ranking managers, who are extremely smart, uh, but often from a very, very different uh, background. And, and this is our target audience. So we cannot have sort of like a conference. You'll see that in, in our slide presentations. They're extremely high level and, you know, probably insulting to some of you here because you are technologists, uh, uh, et cetera. But the, our, our target audience in the public administration, they're extremely smart people, the managers, the translators, the people in the archival uh, units but they have a different background and finding a good language, communicating our needs and our objectives, et cetera, that's the challenge. And that would be the challenge that you have to focus, kind of like you have to hone the computational linguistics community to find the, the right language to communicate. I agree with you, uh, but uh, well, uh, maybe I, I, I didn't express myself uh, clearly. When I was saying uh, involvement of uh, the computational linguistics community, I was the involvement of those parties that uh, who already had uh, experience uh, in dealing with the public admin administration. So that's uh, so they are able already to speak with them, not uh, just to have uh, spoken. Okay. I can provide an example of how we did it in uh, Latvia. Uh, we recently launched a huge. Uh, Okay, but for Latvia it's a huge system, but in general it's not a huge, huge system. For uh, MT system for public administration that is integrated as well in some already existing uh, services. And in the uh, RIG workshop it was presented by a um, minister representative, representative who is responsible for that. And uh, surprisingly all participants were really surprised that this system exists and how does it work? And we show this as a one small step to our large idea, uh, how, how it can work in the future. So we can start with a local, adapt, create, and uh, provide, and then move forward to whole Europe. And uh, this was a good, a good example in Riga, how we did that.